Well, it's undeniable that Jesus is the most famous person in all of history. And we could talk about that for days, but we're only going to look at one particular point in the life of Jesus, and that is his trial in Jerusalem. Well, it's undeniable that Jesus is the most famous person in all of history. And yet, many would say that the historical Jesus is unknowable or he's legendary, that our primary sources about Jesus, the four Gospels, are propaganda and and even contain much myth. Well, there's a great deal of archaeological material connected both indirectly and directly to Jesus, and we could talk about that for days, but we're only going to look at one particular point in the life of Jesus, and that is his trial in Jerusalem. His trial before both the religious and political authorities in Jerusalem on one day in 33 AD. But to begin, I want to say something about our primary sources. Our primary sources are the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I want you to understand that we do have very early manuscript copies of these. They have not been changed over the centuries, and we don't just have late medieval period copies. So we can be, we can confidently say that what was originally written about Jesus is what we have today. But many are going to dispute these sources, and many people even say that there is no record or no historical record or evidence for Jesus outside of the New Testament, which is patently false. We have 11 sources from the 1st and 2nd century outside of the New Testament that talk about Jesus and various aspects of his life. Some of those even include discussion of the trial of Jesus, which we are going to focus on. But this trial was set in Jerusalem during the first century, as I said, 33 AD. At the time, you had two major authority figures, Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas, the high priest. So here we have the religious and political major authorities. We had a number of factions within the city. The Romans, of course, who were dominant politically and militarily. We have the Sadducees. Uh, These are... This is the group of the high priests. Caiaphas was a Sadducee. We have the Pharisees who were over the synagogues and thought of as more conservative than the Sadducees. We have the Herodians who were also friendly towards the Romans. We have zealots who wanted to rebel and did so against Rome. And probably even some Essenes within Jerusalem, although that was not their their main location. The population of the city... Uh, We can only give an educated guess, since we don't have accurate census figures, but probably around 80 to 100,000 people on a normal day. But this was not a normal day. The trial of Jesus occurred at the beginning of Passover. And with festivals like this, the most important festival in the Jewish calendar, you may have had as many as one million visitors coming to Jerusalem. So the city was overflowing. It was a walled city, which is different than many of the Roman period cities in the first century because the Romans didn't want to have to go and break down walls if there was a revolt. And we see this actually happened in 70. There was a former palace and a praetorium of the Romans, which is one of the main sites of the trial. There was the temple, the Antonia Fortress, which was the barracks for the Roman soldiers. There was a theater even in Jerusalem. Uh, ritual bathing pools for those who were going to go up to the temple, aqueducts, bringing in water from quite a distance, and of course, residential quarters of various socioeconomic qualities. But in the trial of Jesus, we have seven characters and five locations. Uh, Especially, we'll focus on four of those locations. Uh, But these people are Annas, a high priest, Peter, the apostle, the disciple of Jesus, Caiaphas, the acting high priest, Pontius Pilate, who was the the governor or the prefect of Judea, Herod Antipas, who is the tetrarch of Galilee, up in the north, where Jesus was from. You have this more obscure character, Simon of Cyrene, and then you have Jesus himself. 
Now, all of these people and all of these places are known and attested archaeologically. We'll begin with the arrest, which occurred in the Garden of Gethsemane at night. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane is an ancient location. We know generally where this garden was. We couldn't say for certain where exactly the arrest of Jesus happened, but there is an ancient church marking that location uh, with a rock that the church is centered around. Now, in John, when it gives us this passage about how the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. This is echoed or mirrored in the Mishnah, which talks about an indictment against Jesus the Nazarene, and they discuss why they want him to be arrested and then ultimately punished uh, by stoning in the Mosaic Law. But we see that is not what happens because the Romans are in charge of capital punishment at this time. Well, Jesus is arrested, and he is taken before Annas, the high priest, first. So Annas is called a high priest by Luke. Luke 3.1 says Annas and Caiaphas. Luke 3.1 and 2 say Annas and Caiaphas were high priests that year. Uh, Why both high priests? Well, in the Mosaic Law, you were a high priest for life or until you could no longer fulfill those duties physically. But in the Roman period, things were different because the Roman governors were calling the shots. And so they would appoint and depose high priests based on their preferences. So Annas had been the high priest from 6 to 15, but he was later deposed. And by the time that we get to the trial of Jesus, his son-in-law Caiaphas is acting high priest. Now Annas is mentioned by Josephus, as well, of course, in the Gospel of Luke. But we also have the tomb of Annas, which was discovered in the Hinnom Valley on the south side of ancient Jerusalem. And this tomb is the most elaborate tomb of that period from Jerusalem. So it's very befitting someone of his status. A high priest who held immense power even after his time acting in that role. Exactly where this encounter with the high priest happened We cannot say for sure, although we have very good candidates within Jerusalem. One of those here is a palatial mansion, a priestly mansion, we might call it. And I think it at least does very well to illustrate what this would have looked like. You see those mosaic floors there with the intricate geometric designs and the different colors. But notice, there are no figures of people or gods or even animals on there because of the Mosaic law of ban on images. So even though these Sadducees were considered liberal at the time, they still did not violate these types of Mosaic law commandments. You also see at the back on the right, two stone water pots. These are the same type of stone ritual washing jars that are mentioned in John chapter 2 in the wedding at Canaan narrative. So this was for ritual washing, just just as that passage also tells us parenthetically. Now, one place that I think is an especially good candidate is what's now called the Burnt House. It is just north of this priestly mansion. But why do I perhaps favor that location? It's because within this house, which was destroyed in 70 AD, they found an inscribed weight with the name of the family who inhabited this house, the Kathros family. And we know from the Talmud that this family was a high priestly family just before the destruction of Jerusalem. And therefore, if they use the same house like the White House is used today, then it would have been this same one at the time of Jesus. However, it's possible that they moved the high priest's house based on who was the the family or the acting high priest at the time. Next, we have Peter. Peter is waiting in the courtyard of the high priest. What kind of archaeological evidence do we have for Peter? Well, we can start with his house up in Galilee, in Capernaum. So the house of Peter is talked about in the Gospels, such as in Matthew 5.14. It talks about Jesus being in Capernaum, and he goes into Peter's home, or Peter's house. Uh, Mark 
gives us some more information about where in the city this is located when he says that immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon, that is Peter and Andrew. Well, the synagogue today, if you exit the synagogue, you walk maybe 10 seconds down the main street of the city to get to what is Peter's house. Now, why would we think that this is Peter's house? Uh, yes, there is a, a church that was built over it in the 5th century, but what about prior to that? Well, all the way back in the late 1st century, this domestic dwelling was transformed into what we might call a house church. It was no longer occupied by the original residents, and they plastered the walls and they began using it as a community meeting space. Well, starting in the 6th century, Christians who went to that church, they started inscribing things in the plaster on this wall. And this is one of the reasons why we know it was an early place of worship. So they they made all these dedications, mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ and prayers and things like that. But we also have a Greek inscription with Peter's name on it and a Latin inscription with Peter's name on it, also associating him with Rome, which is where he went after this time. We have early pilgrim accounts as well, who understand that it was the house of Peter even before an official church building was constructed over the site. But there's more about Peter. Underneath the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, a tomb was discovered. Now, this basilica was built to commemorate Peter and his martyrdom, but excavations didn't happen there until the middle of the 20th century. What they discovered, though, was this reburial in the 2nd century of a man aged between about 60 and 70 years old, based on the analysis of his skeletal remains. And next to this tomb was an inscription with the name Peter on it. Uh, And some look at the second part of the inscription, and they say this is referring to Peter being in here, in the tomb. Well, When the bones were further analyzed, they noticed that there were remnants of every part of the skeleton except for from the ankles down. So this fits the description of Peter, who was crucified upside down and would have been cut down from the cross, leaving his feet nailed to the beam or perhaps later discarded. So not only do we have inscriptions mentioning Peter, We may even have the bones of Peter, which would probably be the only skeletal remains of any of the apostles that we actually have today. There's one other connection to Peter, and that is the rooster crow. Well, this inscription that you see here is a Hebrew inscription that was originally on one of the corners of the Temple Mount, uh, on the southwestern side. It would have fallen down from one of the towers that was there on the side. And it's partially broken, but we do see that it read, for the place of trumpeting to declare. Now, if we go and consult Josephus, who was a first century historian who was from Judea, he talks about this practice. He talks about the trumpeting, which was done by priests on the towers of the Temple Mount, and it was to commemorate the beginning and end of the Sabbath and other important days like holy days. So when we look at those passages in the Gospels connecting to Peter and him listening in and his denial, we see, such as in Luke, he says, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Uh, this may have been actually a reference to the trumpeting that sounded at the beginning of the Sabbath. Well, what day was being inaugurated early that morning? It was Nisan 14, the beginning of Passover. That is one of the specific times that they would use for that trumpeting. Jesus, though, is next brought in front of the acting high priest, Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas had really the ultimate say. Annas was very influential, but Caiaphas was the high priest and he was the head of the Sanhedrin, the high religious council of Judaism at the time. So they needed to bring Jesus before him really to pronounce a judgment. Caiaphas, of course, is mentioned by name in the gospel accounts of the trial, but he is also discussed briefly in Josephus, and Josephus actually gives us his full name, Joseph Caiaphas, or Joseph 
son of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was his family name. So like we have President Biden, we have High Priest Caiaphas using their family name. Well, Jesus was brought to Caiaphas at the meeting place of the Sanhedrin, which was the Hall of Hewn Stone. In about 30 AD, this was moved slightly from right next to the temple itself to the southern part of the temple complex. Uh, Today, even though these buildings were destroyed in 70, they have set up the column capitals from some of the ruins that that building was part of. So you can see that today on the southern part of the Temple Mount. But Caiaphas is also attested archaeologically by his ossuary. This is a bone box. This is where his bones were placed approximately one year after his initial burial. And this bone box is the most elaborately carved of any ossuary that's been found in the region. But it also has in Aramaic his name, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. So we're able to identify that. Now, another ossuary sheds even more light on this. It was the ossuary of his granddaughter. And it tells us a little bit more information about this family because it says, son of Caiaphas, priest of Maaziah from Beit Imri, which is a priestly line that's mentioned in First Chronicles 24. So we know that Caiaphas was actually a legitimate priest from a real priestly line, which was not always the case in the Roman period. And this further attests to his role and prominence as a high priest in the first century. Well, even though Caiaphas was the head of the religious council, because of the Roman government, he did not have the authority to execute Jesus. And therefore, Jesus had to be sent to the Roman governor, which was Pontius Pilate. So Pilate had the title of prefect at this time. This is a specific type of governor. It depends on the type of province. Uh, In 44 AD, he switched from prefect to procurator. So Actually, a Roman historian, Tacitus, makes an error when he talks about Pontius Pilate as governor of Judea. He refers to him as a procurator, but he was actually not. He was a prefect. And if we look in Luke, he uses a Greek word that is more reflective of prefect. But Pilate is, of course, attested throughout the New Testament, not just in the Gospels, but Acts and even the letter of Paul, 1 Timothy. He is written about in Tacitus, as I mentioned, and in Josephus, and also Philo of Alexandria. So he's very well attested from these ancient manuscripts. Pilate also issued coins during his time as the governor of Judea. And here you have two examples of those coins. Now, what do you notice? There are no images on them. There are no images of Roman emperors or of Roman gods which was atypical, but it seems that because of Judea's uniqueness and their monotheism and and the offense that the people would take at images, that some of the governors tried not to stir things up with the people of Judea, and so they, they didn't put images on here. And Pilate tries to be a good governor and not make his people rebel or revolt. Now, Pilate did not put his names on these coins because that was not the practice of Roman provincial governors. But what he does put are some Roman imagery and then the name of the Caesar Tiberius. However, Pilate is attested archaeologically through two other discoveries. The first is the Pilate Stone, which I think by this time is quite well known. It was unearthed in 1961 at Caesarea Maritima in reuse in their theater. But originally, it was a dedicatory inscription that had probably been placed at the front of a temple for the emperor Tiberius or some other building honoring Tiberius. And on it, it gives us his name, Pontius Pilatus, and his title, Prefectus of Judea. So we see there his correct title rather than later on in Tacitus making a slight error. More recently, however, this ring, this pilot ring, was noticed, I should say, uh, because it was actually excavated just a few years prior to the pilot stone, but it wasn't cleaned and known until very recently. 
And this was a bronze ring. And on it, instead of a Latin inscription, we have the Greek name, Pilato. This is the same form that we see in the Greek New Testament. Uh, this was found at Herodium, which is near Bethlehem. It was probably not used by Pilate himself. It would have been used by someone in his administration who was stamping documents for the approval of Pilate's administration. And then finally, we have something tentative. Uh, it's called the Ameria inscription. It was discovered in Italy outside the church of St. Secundus. Unfortunately, it's currently lost. But it has a Latin inscription on it with Pilate's name, Pilatus, and this Roman position, uh, which was a, a local city official who was responsible for conducting the census every five years. So this, this may also uh, connect to Pilate, who consequently was from Italy, and according to early sources anyway, he went back there after uh, his time as governor. <clears throat> now, one of the biggest problems that many scholars have with the trial narratives in the gospel is they look at this and they question why would Pilate give in to the demands of the Jews and let Jesus be crucified? They say this is not reflective of what we see in ancient history or in Pilate's history. So I want to give a little bit of historical archaeological context to understand that. <clears throat> a very important quote comes from John, and only John. John 19.12 the Jews protested and told Pilate, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Now, this was a specific designation for somebody who had the favor of the emperor, a politician who had the favor of the emperor. So they are threatening to somehow get that favor revoked for Pilate, and this could have serious consequences for him. Why? Two main reasons. Pilate had had a lot of problems in the province, as every governor there did, but there was also a treason resulting in an execution that had happened not long before in Rome. So first of all, with Pilate's previous incidents in Judea, probably the earliest one is he brought imperial standards into Jerusalem that had the image of Caesar on them, so this would violate the Mosaic law ban on images. This is recounted in Josephus. And so some of the Jews, at least the conservative ones, were upset about this and they wanted those gone. So he got rid of them. Next, we have the golden shields brought into Jerusalem. Philo talks about this. I don't think they're the, the two are the same event. Probably why they got offended at this was they may have had some other pagan imagery on them and the, the name of the Caesar. Maybe they were pushing a little bit to be offended, but anyhow, this also caused a, a small uprising. The next thing that happened was that Pilate used funds from the temple treasury to construct an aqueduct, which probably brought water to the temple, and he thought that he was justified in doing this, but this also caused some serious problems and complaints with the Jews. And then finally we have in Luke 13.1, the blood of Galileans mixed with their sacrifices. Now we don't know exactly what happened here, but it seems like Pilate killed some Galileans and tried to defile them further by mixing them with their sacrifices. Some, some kind of revolt must have happened, small scale, and he had these people executed. So there were at least four incidents that caused problems within Judea before the trial of Jesus. And for Pilate to keep having complaints sent to him, or sent to the emperor about him, was not a good thing. It was something he wanted to avoid. He knew that eventually he might suffer consequences for that, such as losing his position as governor or even being ejected out of politics and, worst case scenario, executed. Now, we know that his concern was well-founded because in 36 AD, the last incident, he goes and sends some Roman soldiers against Samaritan rebels. They kill these rebels. They sent a complaint to Rome and Emperor Tiberius recalled Pilate to Rome. Fortunately for Pilate, the emperor died before Pilate got back to Rome, and so his case was dropped when Caligula came in as emperor. 
So he had very good reason. But there was even more going on in the background. That's because in 31 AD, the commander of the Praetorian Guard named Sejanus was executed for treason. Now, he had been building up his power and essentially ruled the Roman Empire in 31 and was plotting in some way to, to be named emperor. But uh, Tiberius, who was living on the island of Capri in self-exile, he finally got wind of this and he created a ruse to, to call Sejanus into the Senate where he thought something good was going to happen to him. Uh, but instead, they proclaimed him a traitor, they executed him, and they executed many of his family, friends, and allies. Some scholars think that Pilate was actually appointed by Sejanus, and so not just the overall mood of the empire, but this association may have put Pilate in even more of a precarious position than he already was. So he had very good reason to not push back against the execution of Jesus. It wasn't to him worth his life and possibly the life of his family. This coin that you see here is a coin that was minted for Sejanus. It actually had his name on it. Most of these, the vast majority of them, were obliterated. His name was scraped off because they tried to remove Sejanus from history because of his treason against the emperor. At least that's how they framed it. So Pilate, what's he do? He sends Jesus off to Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch. Well, why? He was the ruler of Galilee, and Jesus was from Galilee, so he thought, uh, maybe this guy could deal with it. Well, Antipas is attested by coins that he minted that have his name and title, Herod the Tetrarch, just like Luke writes about him. Uh, we see one of the cities that he built, his capital city, actually, Tiberias. This is the, the theater at Tiberias. And he is also discussed in both Josephus and Philo. So Jesus has been sent back to Pilate at the Praetorium. The Praetorium has been partially excavated. This was in the former palace of Herod the Great. It's on the west side of the city. If you face Jaffa Gate and go to your right, you will run into it. And here what you see is a gateway leading into the Praetorium. And then you see another stone carved uh, step that would have gone into the inner part. But to the left, you see sort of this wall, this raised area. That is the Gabbatha. And on top of the Gabbatha is the stone pavement, which some still exist today. On the left side there, the left photo, you can see the Lithostrotos, which is talked about by John. So we have the stone pavement, we have the Gabbatha, we have the Bema, which is the judgment seat, where Pilate rendered his decision. All of these things are still in existence today and were uncovered during excavations in the 1970s. So Pilate allows Jesus to be crucified and they lead him away. He's got to get his crossbeam up to Golgotha. And he can't do it because of how badly he's been beaten. And so they enlist this person in the crowd named Simon of Cyrene. And we even are told in Mark's account that Simon had a son named Alexander. Well, there is an ossuary discovered from first century Jerusalem that had on it these inscriptions, Alexander, son of Simon, and then where he was from, or his, his lineage, the Cyrenean. So he was from Cyrene. This is probably an inscription referring to the son of Simon who carried the crossbeam for Jesus. And then finally, the last person attested here is Jesus himself. Jesus is attested seemingly on two first century inscriptions as well as several historians and philosophers of the first and second centuries. But we see the James ossuary here. Now this is a very, very unique inscription because it contains three names. If you look at other ossuary inscriptions, they will often contain something like uh, Jesus, son of Joseph, or Jesus the Builder, something like that. But they don't have something like James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. In fact, only one other ossuary inscription ever discovered refers to the brother, and it doesn't include the father. And so we know the people writing this 
for trying to specify the person. And that this brother, this Jesus, was someone well-known who would qualify who this James was. Well, James was well-known as the brother of Jesus. We see this, again, in Josephus when he talks about the martyrdom of James in Jerusalem in about 62 A.D. Well, this, this inscription, this ossuary, was the subject of much controversy for many years, but the result of that and all the trials essentially showed geologists confirmed the authenticity of the box, and the analysis of the patina, which is the residue left in the inscription, showed that the entire inscription was made in antiquity. It was not a modern forgery. And a statistical study looking at the population of Jerusalem and the percentage use of these names determined that less than two people would qualify for this specific connection of names, which essentially leaves us only with the possibility that this is talking about Jesus of Nazareth the Christ. Now, even more recently, a very interesting cup was discovered in the harbor of Alexandria. It was unearthed in 2006. I think 2008 is when people first started talking about this, but it's not so well known. On this was a Greek inscription, and it says something like, Through Christ the Magician. There's, there's a lot of debate about this magician part, but possibly not really any better explanations at this point. Now, why, why would they talk about Christ the Magician on this cup? Well, Egypt was obsessed with magic in antiquity. And they were always trying to use magical formulas. And they knew about Jesus. People knew about the miracles of Jesus. In fact, Celsus in the second century attributes the miracles of Jesus to Jesus having acquired miraculous powers in Egypt when he was there as a child. Uh, we also see this in the magical papyri of Egypt from just a bit later. Uh, one passage in particular is very interesting where it says that how do you cast out demons? You invoke Jesus, the name of Jesus, God of the Hebrews. So they're trying to harness his power there. They see him as a magic worker, but they're aware of his title, Christ, here. Well, because of these miracles and because of his claims of being God, uh, he is ultimately executed by crucifixion. And the crucifixion was well known throughout the Roman world not long after the death of Jesus. In fact, the first artistic representation that we have of the crucifixion comes from Rome and comes from pagans who are mocking Christianity. Uh, this is often known as the Alexamenos Graffito. It was found on the Palatine Hill. It shows Jesus with a donkey head and then a Christian named Alexamenos is there worshiping him. Could Jesus have been crucified and then given a proper burial in Jerusalem prior to 70 AD? Yes, he could. How is this demonstrated? By the discovery of a man named Yehohanan, who was a Jew and a crucifixion victim in first century Jerusalem, who had a proper burial and was eventually placed in an ossuary. Um, because of his remains and the remains of another skeletal skeletal remains of another person who was a crucifixion victim. We know that the descriptions in the New Testament of crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus, also fit with what the Romans were doing at that time. That is, putting a nail into the feet and also into the wrists. This crucifixion, this trial even, is discussed in other historical sources outside of the New Testament, like Tacitus, uh, Serapion, makes an allusion to it, and then Lucian also talks about the crucifixion of Jesus. So all this to say, the trial of Jesus is extremely well corroborated by archaeological evidence and ancient historical manuscripts outside of the biblical record. And so, with the words of Peter, I will conclude this. He says, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's the end of the trial, but of course, this is not the end of the story. 